Morning everyone, it is such a privilege to be with you this morning. A few quick notices, actually five, but really exciting ones all around. The first one is just a little bit of an update on meetings as a church and locations and those sorts of things. Uh, the exciting thing is we are going to be able to have Christmas services. We're going to send you more details about that, but we're really excited. And also if you're wondering, where can I meet? What's happening on a Sunday? We are meeting in three different places on a Sunday. And if you want to find out more about that, please do get in touch with the office. We obviously have to make sure that we monitor numbers in those different spots, but we are meeting, so get in touch with us. The one area that we're struggling on because of venue is an area that works with kids. So we're still looking for that and analyzing that for the holidays now and going into next year, but we're really, really excited at what God's doing in those different venues and, uh, and how He's working through us as a church. Um, the church fast that we've been doing sort of once a month um, has been going great and hearing awesome testimonies about it. Um, and so we missed uh, explaining or saying that we were going to be doing it last week. Um, and so you, if you did it, great. If you didn't, we want to fast again next week, Wednesday. And why are we fasting? Well, we're giving up our stomachs, as it were to make us really think about the Lord and pray about different things. So we want to pray about our nation. We want to pray about our church. We want to pray that we would shine brightly for Christ in the city and beyond. So we'll let you know more about that. But Wednesday next week, we're going to be doing that. The men's early morning prayer uh, was a cracker uh, last week, uh, not last week, last month, and that is going to be happening this Tuesday. So again, we'll send out uh, more on email and on WhatsApp about it, but uh, early morning Tuesday, we can't wait to have the men praying together. I have no doubt that when men pray, it changes families, it changes structures, it changes uh, businesses, it changes nations. And so I'm, I'm passionate about it and I'm excited about doing that this Tuesday. And then the last thing I wanted to share is that Leona, um, one of the girls who's gone all the way through uh, Runyurara Orphanage, which we are part of and we, we, we operate and run as a church, has just graduated with a degree from Africa University. And what a privilege to be able to care for someone as, as a young child, to see them looked after, cared for, um, know the Lord, be parented in a sense through Runyurara, and now get to the place of graduating with a degree in business administration. It's so exciting. And that's just a small little part of what, um, what, what we're doing as a church, what you're invested in as a church. And so I just want to say well done and thank you. Over these past few months, although church has been different, uh, we've been blown away. There's been people helping out with the elderly. There's been someone who has either had an injury or is finding difficulty and people have stepped in to help. There's people giving sacrificially to see um, poverty erased in different areas, to support different ministries, and just genuinely caring for each other as the body. And so, so well done and thank you. Um, it's amazing that the body operates even when things in society are different. So a few quick notices there and we're just so encouraged as a team at what God's doing in this different season. But I want to pray for us as we dive into today's message. So let's pray together. Holy Spirit, I'm so aware that if you don't speak clearly through me, through us who are preaching, Holy Spirit, if you don't come, if it's, not, if it's not your word, then there's no power. There's no life change. And so I pray that as we dive into the passage today, as we look at your word today, that God, you would speak. That you would touch, that you would encourage, that you would challenge, that you would minister to, that you would heal. Father, as the sovereign all-powerful God that you are, the loving, passionate Father that you are, that you would touch and transform in these moments together for people who know you and people who don't know you today. Father, I pray that you would move with power and authority in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Sarah and um, I love watching the series on Netflix called The Crown. Some of you may have heard of it. It follows the life of the British monarchy. And although there's no doubt fictional elements to it, it is a work of fiction. It's not a documentary. Um, it does seem to follow history fairly accurately and sort of as accurately as I think anyone could. If you look at what actually happened in history, um, conversations, even what people look like, they've really tried to model this in the most amazing way. And so in one of the final scenes 
of the most recent series, uh, or the most recent series, the final scenes. Prince Philip, the Queen's husband, is seen talking to Princess Diana about the difficulties she's facing in her marriage with Prince Charles and about really feeling like an outsider in the royal family. And this is what he says, one of the final sentences of the series. He says, after all these years, I still am. He's talking about being an outsider and he was as well coming into the family. He says, after all these years, I still am. We all are. Everyone in the system is a lost, lonely, irrelevant outsider apart from the one person, the only person that matters. She is the oxygen we all breathe. She is the essence of all our duty. Your problem, he's talking to Diana, if I may say, is you seem to be confused as to who that person is, to who the central person is in the story. Now, whether that scene actually happened in real life or not, we're not sure. It was an incredible moment showing that everyone in the royal family, whilst they have position and rank, and they do, whilst they have value in the royal family, they play a very small role compared to the queen. In fact, their roles are there to show that the queen is the most important of all. That's why they're there. They do have position and rank, they do have value, but they're all there to point towards the one, the ultimate one, the queen. Now, as I was watching this, I felt God just nail me. I felt the Holy Spirit just challenge me to the core. That when it comes to our faith as Christ followers, there are some incredible similarities to that statement from the crown, except for one very important point. You see, when compared to the Lord Jesus, we are not lost, we are not lonely, and we are not irrelevant outsiders, as Prince Philip said to Princess Diana. As part of his family, we become members that are found some of you may know the story Luke 15, the prodigal son, where God pursues, where God finds, where God waits for the one who is lost. So we're found, we're part of community. So we're not outsiders, we become part of the family and we are deeply valuable to him. We're not irrelevant, we are deeply valuable individually to the Lord Jesus. But, and this is a huge but, we exist for him. God doesn't exist for you and I, we exist for Him. Our role is most definitely and completely, just as the royal family members are to the Queen, our role is to magnify, to glorify, to make much of, to point towards, to focus on, to live for the matchless worth of King Jesus. In short, life is not about us. I want you to let that sink in today of all the teaching that can be heard of everything you can listen to um, about faith and from different preaching. I want you to know that life is not about you and it is not about me. We are not central to the story. Jesus is. We are valuable, but we are not central to the story. The Lord is the happiest one in existence, but our happiness is not his ultimate goal. God chose to create us and to love us. He loves us as far as the east is from the west. But he does not need us. He never did and he never will. His ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And realizing these truths, realizing that you and I are not central to the story and that he is and living from this perspective, I can guarantee you it will change your life for your good and for his glory. It will without a shadow of a doubt, if you live with that perspective that he is central to the story and not you and I, it will transform your life for our good and for his glory. So with that, I want to read through a short passage in Colossians. Colossians 1, if you have your Bibles, that I feel the Lord has laid on my heart for us today. So Colossians 1 verse 15 to 20. It's put under different headings in different passages um, in, uh, or in different Bibles, but mine says the centrality of Christ, the central nature of Christ in the story. And this is what it says. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him 
and for him. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What a powerful, amazing passage. To me, it's one of those beautiful passages that should stop you and I dead in our tracks. It should be one of those passages that makes us stop and gives us this healthy perspective of where Jesus is and where we are. And that is the best place to be. It is humbling. Uh, it is something that makes us feel rather small, but it is just a wonderful, wonderful passage. So let's tear it apart for a little bit in the time we have left. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. You see, he's the image of the invisible God. What's the passage saying? It's saying we know through Jesus what God is like. He came to earth. He walked this earth fully man and fully God. So, so we know when, when we're wondering what exactly is God like? What does, he, what does he look like? What is his character? We see it in Christ. If you're ever wondering what exactly is this God that I, I'm finding out about or this God that I follow, what is he like? We see it in Christ on earth. Then it goes on and it says, firstborn over all creation. What's it saying? Because Jesus hasn't been born first. He's God. He is fully God. He always has been. He was there before the foundation of the world. But what Paul who writes this is getting at is that Jesus is the son of the monarch. He's, um, he is, uh, he's the son of the king that he would go on to inherit ruling sovereignty. The firstborn, the most valuable of all. In Philippians 2 verse 9 to 11, this, is, this backs up him being sort of uh, that, that sovereign nature. It says verse 9 to 11, For this reason God exalted him, highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name. You know, the name that's above every name, it's so interesting. If you say Jesus Christ, it brings a reaction. I don't know if you've noticed this. You can say God, you can say Father, you can say Lord, you can talk about God in general. But if you say Jesus Christ, it causes a reaction, either for or against. But there's no middle ground if you talk about Jesus Christ. Why? God's given him the name that's above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Not every knee will bow now on earth. But one day everyone will stand before God and, and by the weight of his glory, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's who he is. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of the monarch, King Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father. Verse 16 says, For everything was created by him in heaven and and on earth, the invisible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He made it all. He made everything. And this is the key point. We need to get this this morning. Look at where it says there at the end of verse 16. Everything has been created through him. All of us, everything we have, our giftings, our abilities, everything we see is through him. And in this last little phrase, and for him. We are created for him. Everything in the world is created for him. I want you to let that sink in. Your life and mine, we were created for him and for his glory, not ourselves. He didn't create us for ourselves. We were created for him. Verse 17, he is before all things and by him all things hold together. He's before all things. He was there at the beginning. He'll be there at the end. There is no end, but he'll be there. He's, he's gone before. He knows how things will pan out. We can be confident. We can be secure. He knows it. We can place our trust in him, whether we understand situations or not, whether we understand difficulties or not. We can place our trust in him. He knows all. And in this amazing phrase, and by him, all things hold together. All things. That's your life and mine, your situation and mine, the chaos that we see the world in this nation and beyond. It is all held together by 
King Jesus. The only reason the, the world doesn't fall into absolute chaos and disintegrate altogether is because he is holding it together. You know, we shouldn't be asking the question of why did something bad happen to me? We should be asking the question or pondering, why would anything good happen to me ever? The only reason anything good happens to you and I in the fallenness and brokenness of this world is because it's held together by a God of love. So the only reason anything good ever happens rather than bad things happening all the time. He holds this fall, fallen world together. He is sovereign. Hebrews 1 verse 3, it says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact represent expression of his nature. So we found that he's the image of the invisible God. Then look at this phrase, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. But that phrase, sustaining all things by the power of his word. You know, the reason why you and I are living right now, the reason why we're breathing is we're being sustained by him. The reason why the world continues to exist, it's being sustained by him. What he says happens. What God says happens, what he doesn't say doesn't happen. That is the power and authority of the God that we serve. Bruce Ware summarizes, the universe is governed by God, not one atom, despot or demon acts in any respect to hinder what God has ordained. Isn't that an amazing phrase? Really does fit in with this passage. The universe is governed by God. Everything holds together. He's before all things. Not one atom, despot or demon acts in any respect to hinder what God has ordained. John 1 verse 21, uh, John the Baptist, he really understood this and had this picture of who God is. He is the one, John 1 verse 27, he is the one coming after me whose sandal strap I'm unworthy to untie. He's the one coming after me, but his sandal strap, his feet, I'm not even worthy to untie. Doesn't that give you a great picture of how the early followers of Christ saw Jesus? He wasn't just a buddy. He wasn't just a friend. He wasn't there to give them what they wanted. He was the king. He was worthy of all praise and honor and glory. And they knew their place. We need to have the same. The Lord is matchless beyond words. The Bible points to Christ on every page. And all characters in the Bible, like the royal family, are there to point towards Christ. Tim Keller talks about Jesus being the ultimate hero. Um, and look at these pictures he gives of, of the Bible all pointing to Christ in Scripture. Jesus is the true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is imputed to us. Jesus is the true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood now and cries out not for our condemnation but for our acquittal. Jesus is the true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave all the comfort um, and all familiar and go out into the void not knowing whether he went to create a new people for God. Jesus is the true and better Isaac, who was not just offered by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us. When God said to Abraham, now I know you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son, who you love from me. Now we can look at God taking his son up the mountain and sacrificing him on the cross. We can say, now we know that you love us. Jesus loves you today. He always loves you. No matter what happens, his love is greater. We know you love us because you did not withhold your son, your only son, from us. Jesus is the true and better Jacob who wrestled and took the blow of, of justice we deserved. Justice for our sin. We're going to talk about that just now. So we, like Jacob, not only receive the wounds of grace to wake us up and discipline us. Jesus is the true and better Joseph who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed him and sold him and uses his new power to save them. Jesus is the true and better Moses who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord who mediates a new covenant. Jesus is the true and better rock of Moses who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. What a beautiful picture. Jesus is the true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer who then intercedes for and saves his stupid friends. Just read Job. What a powerful story. Jesus is the true and better David, who, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. Jesus is the true and better Esther, who didn't just risk leaving an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate and heavenly one, who didn't just risk his life, 
but gave his life to save his people. Jesus is the true and better Jonah who, cast, who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. Jesus is the real rock of Moses, the real Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain, so the angel of death will pass over us. He is the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, the true bread. The Bible is really not about you. It's about him. It's all about him. I trust and pray as we're going through this message, it just sinks in deep. Holy Spirit, please do it amongst us that the Bible and life is not truly about us. It is about him. Goes on there and it says, he is the head of the body, the church. You see, you can't be a Christ follower and not love God's church. And I know as we people, us as people, we make up the church, of course. The church isn't a building. We don't, you know, it's not the actual building. We're people who meet collectively together. But when Paul talks about the the church, he doesn't mean individuals. He's talking about us meeting together as the saints. He means gathering together. And so as a Christ follower, we have to care about the church because Jesus is the head of the church. We have to care about God's church. This means attending, being part of it, serving the body, uh, giving sacrificially, sharing, caring. It's his church. It's God's church. And what a privilege to see it in action through Harvest and God's church in the northern suburbs. It says he is the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything. See, him rising from the dead was proof that he is God. Look at this passage, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 to 6. For I passed on to you, this Paul talking to the Corinthian church, as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. So Paul is writing, and he's writing to people there who witnessed it. They could have automatically said, Paul, this is all lies and rejected this book in the Bible. But Paul is saying he rose again, the firstborn of the death. That's proof that we can put our trust in him to be raised from the dead as well. Verse 19 to 20 as I close. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him, to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the gospel. This is the good news in action. But why do we need to be reconciled to God? It says there, um, God was pleased to dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself. Why do we need peace to be made? We're quite good people. We're not that bad. You see, when matched up to a perfect, holy God, we're all separated from God. I did a video a a few weeks ago about comparing ourselves to others versus comparing ourselves to God. I'll, I'll post it in the notes of the preach for you to watch. But the point is, is that when compared to God, we are all separated. It doesn't matter how small our sin may be or how small we think it may be, it pollutes us. It pollutes our hearts and it prevents us from having a relationship from the living God. But a little sin isn't that bad. My wife, Sarah, was sharing with me a short uh, story or illustration on this. If we had this bottle of water and uh, then I said to you guys, hey guys, you know what? Um, I'm just going to put a few drops into this, just a little bit of sewage. I'm just going to open up my septic tank and, and I'm just going to get a few drops in. I, I'm just going to pop these drops in here um, and, uh, and maybe, maybe if not that, maybe I'm going to put a few drops of diesel or petrol in um, and, and you know, it's, it, it's not a lot compared to this and we'll just shake it up together we'll put those drops in and let's get some ice and pour it on I wonder how many of you would be saying oh Craig I would love to drink that water with that sewage it's not going to have an effect that sewage it's not going to it's not going to bug me I'm very happy to drink this water of course we wouldn't see those few little droplets they pollute this entire bottle of water they pollute it you see every little drop of sin Every bit of sin in our hearts, every thought, every action, it pollutes us and it creates a gap between us and the perfect God. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, 
Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. God is angry at sin. Wrath is a very powerful word. And that is what he thinks about sin. It is raw anger. And that anger will separate us from him for all eternity. That's why we needed to be reconciled. That is why Jesus came to rescue you and I from the coming wrath. From the coming wrath. Psalm 53 verse 3. Everyone has turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one good, not even one. None of us can stand before God and say we don't need to be reconciled. None of us can say our sin doesn't matter. Isaiah 53 verse 6. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him, Jesus, for the iniquity of us all. J.I. Packer, he says, God's wrath in the Bible is never the capricious or capricious, self-indulgent, irritable, moral, ignoble thing that human anger so often is. It is instead a right and necessary reaction to objective moral evil. God's wrath is right because when there is justice, it must burn against evil. The amazing thing is, is that our sin was loaded up on the perfect Jesus Christ and he faced the wrath of God, the full brunt of God's wrath against sin on the cross. And so if we have Christ, that wrath is covered. If we don't have Christ, that wrath burns against us and Christ steps in and changes that for us. You see, justice demands that sin cannot be swept under the carpet. We all want justice. We just don't want that justice pointed at us. But we must have justice, otherwise there's no true love. There's no true love. Who wants to follow a God who doesn't deal with justice? We want justice served, and that justice paves the way for us to see the demonstration of Christ's love. And so we all needed to be reconciled. We need to be reconciled, but how? Well, God moved towards us as we see in dramatic love by making peace through His blood shed on the cross so that his wrath would not burn eternally against us but it would be placed upon his son on the cross as payment for our sin so that justice would truly be served it's why jesus's blood needed to be shed in the most horrific death ever it's why god's wrath needed to be poured on him as the sacrifice for you and i 1 timothy 1 verse 15 and we're we're coming to a close the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I'm the worst of them. That was Paul talking. He understood his mess. He understood his sin. And until we understand our mess, until we see it for what it is before God, we can never truly accept what Jesus did on the cross. It just doesn't have a lot of meaning to us if we don't think we really need him. But boy, do we need it. Colossians 2 verse 13 to 14. You who were dead in your trespasses, dead in our sin. That's where we all were. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. What a beautiful picture of God's love. If you're worried or, or thinking, does God really love me? Things are going tough in life. Things aren't going well. Does he really love me? Look to the cross. Look to the cross and you know his love see we need God's grace and his mercy every day we need his mercy so that we're not treated as our sins deserve and we we need his grace so that we truly know what it means to be children of the king a life that we most certainly don't deserve but he freely gives I love this definition of mercy and grace from the God questions website it's an amazing resource. If you ever have, you're wanting to know answers to tough questions, check that out. I'll put that also in the notes, gotquestions.org. But look at what their translation of mercy and gross, the, uh, grace, not gross, that we experience on the cross. In common usage, mercy and grace are often used interchangeably. They do not mean the same thing, but they integrally, uh, excuse, excuse my talking on that, integrally related and may be considered two sides of the same coin of salvation grace and mercy see when God saves a person he extends both mercy and grace mercy is forgiving the sinner and withholding the punishment that's justly deserved showing compassion mercy is us not getting what we do deserve in salvation 
God does not show one without the other. Grace is heaping undeserved blessings upon the sinner. In Christ, the believer experiences both mercy and grace. Such a beautiful picture of what Jesus achieved for us on the cross. And so, yes, we most definitely exist to live for and to point others towards the only one who truly matters, the air that we breathe, the one who holds the world together, who is glorious above all. That's why we exist. But we are dearly loved. We are flooded with mercy and grace. We're saved from eternal wrath and we are valued beyond our understanding. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. Let's pray together today. Heavenly Father, King Jesus, my prayer for us today is that we would truly get how worthy you are. We would truly understand the magnificent, magnific, magnificent <laughs> and wonder and glory of who you are. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would know that life is not about us, but that Christ died for us. That life is not about you and me, but you love us. You paid a great price for us. And Lord, when we get that perspective, when we get it right in our hearts, that the world doesn't revolve around us, but that it revolves around you, it changes everything. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would break into people's hearts. If there's selfishness, if there's pride, it would be crumbled into humility and gratefulness. If there's a sense of, does God love me? It would be replaced with a wonder of the cross and what you paid for us and that you would restore the joy of our salvation today. That what you did on the cross would be enough. That depression would be smashed in light of what you've done on the cross. That value would be returned when we see how much you loved us. Holy Spirit, would you break in the encounter that people need today of you, the living God? Would it be experienced as we gaze and wonder at you, King Jesus? In your powerful name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us today. I trust it's encouraged you and challenged you because Scripture is challenging. God challenges us to the core, but it's only when we see our right place between us and God that He can do something incredible in our lives. And so I, I, I trust that you'll live that out this week. If you need support or encouragement, more information about things that are happening at the church, please get in touch with us. And uh, we look forward to the events happening this week and the run into Christmas. And uh, we pray you have a brilliant day. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing what God does. Thanks so much.